Before we begin the five second rule, we want to tell you about our sponsor, Mon Lika Healthcare. Clinicians around the world are under constant pressure to reduce HAIs. In large peer reviewed studies, daily bathing with CHG shows significant reductions in infection rates. HippoCleanse provides the benefits of an antiseptic and a skin cleanser all in one. The 4% CHG formulation rapidly kills clinical relevant pathogens and provides persistent protection. Proven to be gentle enough for daily use, HippoCleanse encourages patients' compliance by washing clean without leaving a sticky residue. Don't just cleanse, HippoCleanse. You are listening to the 5 Second Rule podcast presented by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. This podcast is produced by the APIC Communications Committee and is intended to be a conversation between our hosts and professionals practicing in the infection prevention and control industry. You will learn and be entertained, but most of all, we hope you will be inspired by our community and the work of our peers. And now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome back to the show. This is APIC's Five Second Rule podcast, and we are your co-hosts. I'm Kelly Holmes, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Lorenza Howard, and my preferred pronouns are she, her. Hi, Lorenza. How are you? I am doing great. How about you? Good. It's good to hear your voice, and I'm super excited about our guest speaker and topic. Today we have with us Rebecca Batchis, and she recently got lots of love on IP Talk for creating a YouTube video walking through the risk assessment and IP program plan. So really, really important documents that are kind of the guidepost for our year ahead in infection prevention. So a little bit about Rebecca. She's an infection prevention senior clinical advisor for Diversi and one of APIC's 2023 strategic partners. Before being an IP clinical advisor, Rebecca was the infection prevention and control program manager for an acute care hospital and short-stay skilled nursing facility. Then from 2013 to 2021, she was an infection preventionist at a large academic medical and level one trauma center in the heart of Detroit, Michigan. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be chatting with you guys today. What inspired you to upload this video and share it across platforms? So interestingly, part of my new role is to check in to IP Talk, which is our APIC online chat board. And I continuously see posts asking for annual plans, risk assessments, um, but we don't have a lot of instruction on how to do it. So a newer infection preventionist was looking for more in-depth help, and we scheduled a webinar, but we failed to actually check with each other what time zone we're in. (laughs) So (laughs) the IP unfortunately got busy, missed the call, And so I decided not to waste the hour. And I've always wanted to do some short videos, instructional videos, and this was my opportunity. So I didn't want to waste the hour. I had everything prepared. And I just set up a Zoom for myself and clicked record and posted it to YouTube. And I'm really surprised that so many people found it um, (laughs) as beneficial as they have because it's choppy and I'm recovering from laryngitis in the video. So it's it's been really (laughs) interesting to see so many people get value out of the video. I love the video because it's choppy, because it's off the cuff. (laughs) I think that it's very relatable. And I think it does speak volumes to the fact that people want to know how to do this and how to do it correctly. So, you know, the volume of downloads that I saw from IP Talk, you know, it really goes to show that this is an important topic that people want to know more about. One of the points you made in your video was how it needs to be a living, breathing document. I really loved your emphasis on that. So tell us a little bit about that. So when we say the document is living and breathing, it means that it has to be um, looked at and evaluated and evolve over time. We all know that in a year, so much happens in our infection prevention programs, and we want to be sure that we capture that because the risk assessment and plan and evaluation is not just what went wrong, it's what went really well. I look at it as a way to celebrate those victories. So a good example might be um, if you're in an area that didn't experience flooding ever before, and um, due to climate change and uh, all of the environmental challenges that we're facing 
you might not have ever had to deal with a flood before. You want to capture that in your risk assessment for the prior year so that you can help prepare your facility for those type of specific challenges. Again, we've, we've had regions that have never dealt with a flood. And so moving forward, you want to build that into your plan so that everybody knows what to do next time. Rebecca, absolutely. And building upon situations, whereas uh, in facilities may have never dealt with a flood. So leading into emergency management and natural disasters, what are some strategies that infection com- uh, preventionists can initiate with continuously updating their risk assessment to ensure that it's that living and breathing um, document? And who should they partner with regarding these, you know, um, emergency situations or natural di- disasters? Because in the age of, you know, climate change, we're seeing more and more natural natural disasters. So who should they partner with and how do they strategically update this document? So in my experience, it's been really important to get all of those key stakeholders together that would be involved in that type of situation. So if we stick with the flooding example, facilities, environmental services, um, risk management, quality, your nursing, and even Our medical staff um, need to know how to respond to these types of situations. So I think that is why a multidisciplinary group is so important, because it's not adding work to them to, to help with the risk assessment, to prepare. It gives everybody a sense of, we know what we're going to do in, in the instance of this emergency. And I personally found it really helpful to have uh, checklist. Um, that's what I, at my last facility, I, they had said, we never had a flood before, Rebecca. And I'm thinking, hmm, in Michigan, I feel like you might've <laughs> had some water before. Uh, we get a lot of rain and we are the Great Lakes state. So um, sure enough, as I advanced in my tenure there, I saw evidence of, of water intrusion, right? We see the peeled paint, et cetera. And so I had a checklist ready to go. Anytime a water intrusion happened, We could categorize, and I found this online, quite frankly. Google is our best friend as IP, as is Mm -hmm. the IP Talk platform, and I modified that to my needs. But as much as we can do building off our risk assessment, once you find that something's an identified risk, build, you know, we used to call them toolkits, whatever it is that you know you can go to to help you take that pause and be prepared to move forward, I think is really critical. So when I implemented a water intrusion checklist at my last facility, it gave everyone such a sense of um, reassurance moving forward. Like, okay, we know what we're going to do. We're going to get our our dehumidifiers out and we're going to look at our supply rooms and categorize that water intrusion. Was it gray water, black water, et cetera? So preparedness is the key. And that's where our risk assessment helps us focus where we need to prepare. I totally agree. And I think it's something, an exercise that we all do at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of our fiscal year, to sit down and look at our risk assessment. But then when they're, we're faced with a disaster like COVID, or last year it was monkeypox, or maybe it's a flood, remembering to go back to that risk assessment, open up that document and add in a new line. Here's something we hadn't thought about before. And then taking it back through committee mid-year to show that you're continuously updating your risks. So I think that that is a very good point. Something else you mentioned, Rebecca, in the video is how the risk assessment becomes an important first step in the process. And then you talked about developing the prioritized goals and how that flows into your prevention plan for the year. So tell us a little bit about, you know, identifying those prioritized goals. You know, how many goals should we have? Should we have a hundred? Should we have three? (laughs) You know, I kind of have seen it go both ways. So what do you think about that? I like the concept of using your risk assessment and having a mathematical calculation. Now I know nothing about math. Um, So math always, you know, intimidates me, but that's why we have templates. You don't have to be a mathematics superstar. So using that template, you get scoring. Um, The one I show, and most risk assessments will do similar, whether it's a percentage or a whole number, there's something calculating based on different categories that says, these are your highest risks. What I like to do is, is define a goal a SMART goal, something that we can measure that's time-related, it's achievable, based on those highest priority items. I think a lot of infection preventionists think they have to do everything all of the time. And you can see that on the IP Talk chat board. 
that they just are overwhelmed with everything. So create goals specific to the highest risk. It seems so simple, but I think we miss it a lot in, especially if we're new and we don't know what we're doing. So you take those highest risk items, those 38% relative risk or the 50% or, you know, if it's a 63%, whatever that, create very specific goals that you can actually look at quarterly and then at the end of the year for your evaluation to say, how did I do? And I like to focus on things that we have metrics for, you know, vaccine rates. Influenza vaccination is a great example because we have to report that. So we all know what our influenza vaccination rates are. Um, So I think whatever your highest risks are, you should have a very strategic goal attached to that. So it it might be three if you're lucky. I, I don't know of any infection prevention programs who will get away with that. Um, if you guys have them, share your magic. Um, so, you know, it depends on that risk assessment. I've done anywhere from, you know, six to 10 goals in a year that I can follow up on. Yes, I think that's a, a good number also. You know, you can't do everything um, that you want to do. And, uh, you know, if you spread yourself too thin, I think then achieving any one goal well, perhaps gets watered down. So I, I agree with the thought process of the prioritized risks, picking the ones that have those highest scores, and then those become your goals for the upcoming year. And then you're able to evaluate because it's measurable, like you recommended, where you stand at the end of the year. So then next year when we're doing our risk assessment, if we didn't reach our CAUTI goal, if we didn't reach our CLABSI goal, then perhaps we need to bump that up on the risk assessment for the upcoming year. Um, So I think that that is really great advice. As far as getting stakeholder buy-in, what is the the life cycle of this? So now we've sat, we've come up with our risk assessment, we've come up with our goals. So where does it go in the facility after that? And how do we get that buy-in? So in talking to my peers and in my past experience, um, a lot of the communication channel is found within our infection control committee, right? Uh, Whatever you call that. Um, I believe mine used to be the Infection Prevention and Control Advisory Committee, Um, IPCAC for short, but I know we all have our committees and we all have our acronyms. The challenge is we talk about buy-in. What can we do to actually move, move this into an interactive process and not just attaching something to the minutes? So when I talk to my peers, that's what usually happens, right? Attach it to the minutes and we hope that everybody reads it, but we all know how short everybody is on time. Maybe that's an, a maybe maybe the answer could be a separate meeting where you pull in those stakeholders and you you really speak to their challenges in their department. That's where you get the buy-in. The whole risk assessment is to support the stakeholders in any of the risks you've identified. And so if you build it as an interactive multidisciplinary process instead of an attachment that you have to read before the meeting, I think that might be a really good place to start. That has been my experience when I was my own program manager, creating a separate meeting, pulling the teams together, say, let's talk about it. And is there anything missing from your team that we can add in to support you? And I think that's a key to buy-in is making it about them, not just about your department, because we know infection prevention touches every single department in, in a healthcare facility. Rebecca, that was some great insights right there because um, I, I think it as a as an infection preventionist, we are ever so behooved to uh, gain buy-in from our stakeholders. So definitely that uh, tidbit regarding making it about them and how this risk assessment impacts them. That's a very great um, recommendation regarding that. And Kelly and Rebecca, you noted that not trying to take on so many goals or trying to achieve achieve all of these goals all at once, but making them more palatable and more smart and more strategic is absolutely key. And I know that as a new infection preventionist, at least for me, seeing my first risk assessment, it definitely seemed as though it was a daunting task. And um, therefore, I would like to know, Rebecca, what additional resources can infection preventionists um, access and or search to complete the, the IP risk assessment more strategically? So, of course, you can watch my video, and that's a good start um, while we're here. Um, Beyond that, uh, beyond that, I think um, the APIC text, our APIC resources are invaluable. 
I know that there's actually a newer resource that I haven't purchased yet. Um, it's a collaborative effort, uh, the Joint Commission and APIC put together um, a resource that we can purchase in the APIC store. Um, haven't seen it yet, but I know that has a lot of risk assessment based materials in it. I think IP Talk is an excellent avenue where you can search for what you're looking for. So simply search risk assessment or simply search annual plan in the upper right hand of the IP Talk platform. And you can see a multitude of examples that other folks have, have started and completed with some contextual information as well. I also think, again, I found great resources just by reaching out to my peers. And that's where the importance, especially if you're alone, um, being a, a solo infection preventionist is so challenging. And if it's yourself and somebody else who's new, also challenging. So really connecting with your chapters and finding a partner, I think, is also important. But the IP talk format is also very helpful to find examples of things just to, to get you started, to get your brain moving. I agree with that. Absolutely. You know, and kind of jumping off of Lorenz's point there as a, a new IP, I remember coming into a facility, I think it was in December, and my lead at the time was like, okay, Kelly, you're going to do the annual evaluation for the, the program this year. And I was like, I can't. I've only been here for, <laughs> you know, three weeks. I don't know what happened this year. Um, and so she, you know, sent me over to the med staff office and I had to pull out all the binders that had all the minutes. They were still very, very non-digital at that time. <clears throat> I guess I'm aging myself, but maybe I'm in denial. Um, <laughs> so what tips do you have for the listeners if they do come in mid-year and they're supposed to build this picture and get a, a firm understanding of kind of where they are and where they need to go? So you bring up a really interesting point. Even in today's digital age, when I started one of my prior positions, I couldn't access any of the prior infection preventionist electronic files. So I was really ah. lost. So this is a great example of why we can't wholly rely on technology because if somebody puts everything on their own drive, yes. <laughs> the next person might not have any access. So this is a great question and I hope very helpful for folks that are starting out just like you were and just like I did. I think one of the best places to go, even though it is a time commitment, is the Infection Prevention and Control Committee meeting minutes. These minutes, if, they're, if they are written in the way that they are intended to be written, should really tell the story of what has been happening month to month or quarter to quarter, whatever, um, whatever schedule you've determined in your facility bylaws. You should see in your meeting minutes exactly what has been going on within your Infection Prevention and Control Program. And that's really what our accreditation partners and state surveyors do. They start digging right into those meeting minutes and they're looking for the story. They're looking for the latest and greatest of what's been happening in your program. And the other thing I found really helpful as I started off new without resources, and this is also a time commitment, so you have to carve the time out, is reading your policies and procedures for infection prevention and control. This is a daunting task, but looking them over to see maybe what's missing and how the facility has defined its policies and procedures might be helpful as well. If you if you truly have no no one to lean on and uh, no source to turn to, I would say go to those meeting minutes and look at your policy and procedures. Very good advice. And then with the meeting minutes, you know, I've kind of seen people do it both ways. You know, but you make a very, very good point about going through them with a fine tooth comb. So whether you're taking your own minutes in a smaller facility, really making sure that you're telling the story that a surveyor would read so that you can see the inception of a problem, the discussion of the problem, and then the resolution of the problem. Or if somebody else is taking your meeting minutes, don't just say, yeah, I reviewed them. It looks good. Like make sure that it <laughs> really has those components in it that you need to tell the story. So that is very good advice. Absolutely. Minute taking is an art form, right? It's a way of whether we like to write or not. It's it's challenging. So again, go to Google and get some tips on how to take good meeting minute notes. And I, I found that really helpful. Yeah, great tip. I, I never think, thought yeah. of I searching think that the Google. 
Uh, at oh, least yeah. based on my experience, I think that that is a definitely a st- more strategic approach. Um, learning how to actually um, formulate meeting minutes to ensure that if you did need to reference those notes, you accurately have details to be able to relay that information to auditors um, to better reflect your infection prevention program. So that's a great tidbit for infection preventionists to really do some digging on how to strategically and accurately um, collect that information and or if it's someone that is collecting the information for you, for you all to collaborate to ensure that the most pertinent details and information are being recorded. So leading into um, more of what we're discussing here, Rebecca, what would you like for listeners to take away from this conversation? And it's second fold. The second question is, what are some future videos that we can look for from you? So I think the key takeaway is that uh, the risk assessment annual plan an annual evaluation is an interconnected process, and you can't really have one without the other. And understanding that it's constantly evolving, living, breathing, and reflecting your challenges and your successes in your program so that you are truly the author of your own story. Um, this isn't um, this isn't a scary story. Um, It should be a celebratory story that really looks at all of the work that you're doing and reflects not just you, but all of all of your departments that are working with you and supporting you. So I think that's really important um, takeaways. Again, you can't have one without the other. Think of it as a process and a constant evolution. And then for my next videos, I think um, I might do one that could be a little shorter on a TB risk assessment. There's a lot of confusion about Um, I still see infection preventionists thinking that they might have to do skin testing every year. Um, So it might be an opportunity to to bring in those CDC 2019 changes. And I think uh, maybe a water intrusion checklist running through that. Um, And if you guys have any ideas, um, I've been asking everybody who reaches out, you know, give me more information about what I can deliver to you to make this meaningful for you. Absolutely. I would recommend possibly doing a poll. Um, you have the notoriety on at least I, I found you on LinkedIn and I, I found oh, the yeah. video to be amazing and something that I thought would be useful, would have been useful as a new IP, at least for me. So possibly fielding maybe the new followers or the <laughs> based on the pop- popularity that you now have regarding this to see what are some of the needs of the infection preventionists that you now have access to. I that totally is a agree. Idea. Yeah, oh, great idea. Yeah. And then did I see a teaser on LinkedIn, Rebecca? IP, are there apps for that? Um, yes. so you have totally piqued my interest. So I will definitely tune in for that one. But the TB okay. risk assessment, huge. I think that that is another great exercise for IPs to learn how to do a functioning risk assessment. And then, yes, I agree. Those 2019 updates are really important to get that message out. Love it. Well, I know what I have to do now. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be a busy lady. <laughs> That's uh, right. Job security. Job security. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I think we all have it. I'm pretty sure infection preventionists have it in the bag with job security. So, Rebecca, we ask all of our guests two questions uh, at the at the end of our episode. So, the first question we have for you is: What have you learned about yourself over the last three years? In keeping with the theme of prioritizing, (laughs) I've learned learned that it's very important for me to keep uh, very specific, categorized task lists. So um, again, tying into that apps for that, I use um, whether it's Google task list or Microsoft task list, um, all of these systems have some sort of task app. And beyond making a to-do list, which can be challenging and overwhelming, I've learned to actually put my tasks into three buckets, low, medium, and high. So my high would be things that must be done within a week that are um, maybe impact patient safety or um, employee safety. Then I have my medium category that that'd be nice, but I don't have to do it before um, the high priority items. And then my low priority might be something like, you know, there's three articles that I really want to read and I need to carve out time for that. So I think it's not just creating a to-do list. I've learned that I need to be very specific about my own 
priorities, my own risk assessment, mm-hmm. and categorize them in a very similar way. So I, I hope you see the, the theme coming through here. <laughs> I love that. Personal risk assessment. I'm going to write that down. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing tip. And <laughs> and with keeping with um, creating those buckets, I think that that is a very valuable tip, especially for some IPs that may be experiencing burnout, especially with this, you know, time in which we are, um, we are in as infection preventionists. So with that second question that I would want to ask you is, what are you looking forward to in infection prevention? Growth. I want to see growth. Mm -hmm. And if we're not getting growth, and when I say growth, I know that infection preventionists are constantly growing. I would like to see infection prevention teams growing. Part of my role whenever I can get in front of a group of people is to emphasize how important infection prevention resources are. And I hope that we're going to be seeing teams grow over time. If um, what I don't want to see is um, physicians cut and teams continue to be stretched with the additional workload that the pandemic put on all of us, we had to continue doing all of our regular work, Mm -hmm. all of the surveillance on top of all of the pandemic management. So I hope that in time we learn that um, there is true, wonderful patient safety benefits and employee safety benefits in growing our infection prevention teams. And that means FTEs. So I really hope to see growth in our field. I want to see tons of positions posting on LinkedIn, and I want them to be diverse positions where we're not just looking maybe for registered nurses or Mm -hmm. one type of um, background or another. I would would love to see growth, and I, I want to support that in any way that I can. Ooh, that is really, really good. You know, I think that infection control is a lot of times seen as a cost center for the hospital. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not huge money makers, but a way that we can show our value, APIC has a great cost savings calculator tool on their website. And so, you know, back to the program evaluation and your risk assessment, you can plug in, you know, expected number of infections versus observed number of infections. How many did you save this year? And kind of give your stakeholders a value of, you know, we prevented three collapses this year. That translates into $60,000. Um, so that's that's a really good point, Rebecca. Growth and then showing value for the program. I Absolutely. completely agree. Cost calculator is a great tool to bring to people. And they've made it very easy where it's a plug and play. Right? And, I know. Uh, we don't do use that. It. Yes. Yeah, we don't. Just give me the answer. We're not all math people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Rebecca, so much for joining us. And I hope that our listeners will go to the website and check out the resources that are available with this podcast, which include a link to your awesome YouTube video. Thanks for listening to Apex Five Second Rule Show. We want to hear from you. Visit us at www.5secondruleshow.org. That's with the number five, where you can contribute to the conversation. Make sure you subscribe and rate us wherever you listen to your podcasts. We're so appreciative of the hard work each of you do every day to make a safer world through infection prevention. Remember, IP stands for important person. You are awesome. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.